you all for attending today. It's a fun occasion and I appreciate our hosts here at ONB having us and, and uh, to our friends at Old National Bank. Uh, I'd like to say I took some pleasure in reading about that nice earnings report uh, in the press release last week. Uh, it's not happening everywhere in the, in the banking industry and we appreciate for those of you at ONB the tough business you are in. But uh, it sounds to me from what little I read uh, that the, the nice earnings are the source of fundamentals rather than something more superficial. I read about uh, improved net interest margin and, and uh, a lower burden of charge-offs and those things sound good to uh, someone on the outside. I, my guess is Mr. Jones down here though and in a more diplomatic way than I'm about to say, uh, Mr. Jones has probably uh, instilled very much a what have you done for me lately uh, attitude down here because that's the way it's going to have to be. Uh, to move ahead, but thank you for having us. It's an interesting little series. Uh, if we're going to speak outside the box, what happens is that you uh, arouse arguments and questions and disagreements uh, when you jump outside the box. And as Lucy said, I'll be happy to uh, listen to any questions you have. I'm not sure I'll answer them, uh, but I'll just be happy to listen to them. Gasoline prices are sharply up. We all know that. It's not the first time they've been sharply up. In fact, they're not as high now as they were before the last uh, oil boom and bust in 2008, but they're up. And uh, it derives directly from the price of crude oil, the world price of crude oil. So when we speak of gasoline, we're speaking ultimately of what is going on in the market for crude oil. What I would uh, start off with today is to mention a few things that are inside the box. Uh, and when we start thinking about what could be at the source or the genesis of these price increases, I would like to mention a few things in the box for the purpose of dismissing them and then think outside the box on uh, something a little bit, in my mind, more fundamental. Oil prices have been up and down for all of our lives. Every time they trend upward, the first thing, uh, the first item of attention is the oil companies. There's a lot of media attention, a lot of attention in political circles. Uh, directed to the oil companies and their profits and like ONB the oil companies will be reporting uh, this week and next their, their quarterly earnings most recent. Uh, if we want to attach blame to the oil companies my caution is be careful. Uh, I don't think that one holds water. If I were to ask any of you in this audience and poll you uh, to name me the largest oil companies in the world my guess is you would miss uh, because the ones we normally associate, ExxonMobil, the, the Dutch, Royal Dutch Shell, the, the names that we normally associate are not even in the top ten. The largest oil companies in the world are all state-run. They are from Russia, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. They're state-run. And as a result, the investor-owned, private shareholder-owned oil companies in the world control less than about 8% of the world's reserves. They have very little impact on uh, the world price of oil. Even if they were, even if we say that the oil companies have been motivated by some sort of greed and some sort of attempt to uh, gain profit at the expense of motorists and buyers, the obvious question that comes up is, since oil prices have run up, they must have been low. Uh, and so if the oil company actions are motivated by some sort of pursuit of profit and, and uh, the overused word greed, then I've, I've got to ask you what made them generous when prices were low. Do they periodically decide to be nice to us only for the purpose of setting us up and sucker, suckering us into buying large cars uh, and, and then to raise the price on us? It doesn't hold water. The oil companies, uh, their actions reflect the world forces in the market rather than set them. There's a popular bogeyman of speculators, traders, people who purchase contracts to buy and sell oil around the world. They are often blamed for the gyrations and fluctuations we see in world oil prices. I want to urge you to be careful there as well. Speculators, in fact, if anything, dampen the fluctuations in the world market for oil. These are firms and individuals who purchase contracts to deliver uh, quantities of oil. Their profit motive comes from purchasing when the price is down and selling when the price is high. And so by doing those two things, what they do in fact is dampen fluctuations. 
they make the market more stable than it otherwise would be. And that allows firms and employers and manufacturers around the world to plan uh, on, on less of a volatile uh, market for oil. If speculators can indeed do all of this, and any of you are tempted to go get in on that action, I would urge you to not to quit your day job. It's a difficult way to make a living, and uh, our, our lives would be uh, more uncertain. I'm not sure they'd be easier without oil speculators, but we certainly would have a great deal more uncertainty uh, about the future uh, course of oil. We have heard much about turmoil in the Middle East. I am not buying it. There's been turmoil in the Middle East since the journeys of Abraham and Moses. I don't think the turmoil in the Middle East is going to subside anytime soon. In fact, the more recent turmoils in the Middle East to me are quite fascinating. They're of a radically different character than what we've seen throughout my lifetime. And that change has occurred only since January. And that change has occurred within 2011. What we're seeing around the Middle East now is young people largely rising up in the streets. They're starting to look at the state police governments to which they've been subjected, such as Egypt, Libya, or they're reacting to despotic royal families, such as Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and they're starting to say to them, we want more freedom. In these days of, of social media, young people in the Arab and Muslim world are beginning to realize that their counterparts in the West have it better. This is a much, much different type of turmoil. And what I have seen conspicuously absent in those people in the streets since January, I do not see a whole lot of anti-Israel uh, sentiment being voiced there. What they're voicing is sentiment against their own rulers. And I might add, in the great events of this past week, the significant events of this past week, um, I did not see, I, I'm astonished at the muted and subdued nature of what I thought was going to be a street reaction around the world to the actions the United States took uh, this past week. So um, I'm, I'm quite, uh, I'm, I'm not one to say that Middle East turmoil is doing anything more than a, a momentary blip. It might disrupt the markets. It does not account, in my mind, uh, for what we are seeing. Now the fourth one is the influence of global demand. We have been reading uh, about the growing demand for petroleum and petroleum products from countries like China, from India, from Brazil, countries that are large and rapidly developing. And here is one point on which I will concede inside the box. I think it's likely that growing demand from around the world is changing a bit of the price structure of world oil markets. These are very large populations and they are beginning to consume but they're not doing it in any type of abrupt or precipitous way. The demand from these countries has been growing very steadily and very predictably ever since I would, I would place the beginning of it in the mid-1970s with the death of Mao Zedong in China and the ascendancy of the market reforms under Deng Xiaoping. Since then, it's been a steady growth, it's very predictable, it's not a surprise to us, and it cannot explain the sharp type of jump that we have seen um, in, in recent months and quarters in the world oil markets. Inside the box, I reject everything except then, to summarize, a fraction of, I will, I will grant a small credit to the rising demand around the world. So then you jump outside the box. When you get outside the box, what you're saying is, it's not that oil is going up, it's that the dollar is going down the dollar is deteriorating so rapidly uh, in, a, in a breakneck speed, uh, unlike anything we've seen in some time in this country, the easiest evidence in favor of what I'm saying is just look at everything else the dollar is deteriorating against. It's deteriorating against corn, soybeans, copper, steel, wheat, cotton. The dollar is, de uh, is deteriorating against the yen, against the euro, against the Australian dollar, for goodness sakes, the Canadian dollar. Uh, the dollar is simply deteriorating. The only reason that you're seeing it in terms of gasoline is because you drive up and down the street and it's hard to escape the signs. If your car, if you can imagine, ran on soybeans, we would be in here today asking what the heck has happened in the market for soybeans. 
it, because it is, it is a manifestation of a decline in the dollar. That means if we really want to look at the price of oil, we have to correct it for a decline in the dollar. We have to correct that over time, that time series data set. We have to adjust that for the inflation that we've experienced in prices and wages. If you were to adjust the price of oil for wages and prices, if you were to go back to the price of oil as it was in 1860, I'm picking a pretty easy year here because that was right before the advent of uh, more sophisticated drilling technology. But if we were to take the price of oil in 1860 and project it forward to today's prices, it would be $400 a barrel. The price of oil, incredibly, adjusted for inflation is cheaper than it was today. It is cheaper today than it was in 1860. If you were to go to the year 1900, fast forward, uh, if you were to go to 1900 around that time and you were to take the price of, uh, in the advent of the use of the automobile in this country, and if you were to adjust for wages and prices and look forward today, you're talking about $10 a gallon gasoline. So a typical family can buy gasoline relative to their income, you understand, relative to the incomes they earn and the wages they're paid. A typical family today can buy gasoline, put in useful to look over time. I might add about automobiles today, not only can they fill their tanks at a fraction of the price, but the cars are better. The cars are safer, they're certainly more comfortable, they run more devices for us, uh, and of course they're more efficient. They earn much, they, they generate for us much better gasoline mileage. Once you correct for inflation, gasoline is not up, it's that the dollar is down. If we were to measure, to state this thing another way, if we were to state this thing, if we were to have world oil traded on the basis of some other currency, you see, that's the problem, is that the U.S. dollar is the currency in which world oil is traded. What if it were traded in euros or yen or Australian dollars or Czech crowns? I can keep going if you want me to. Uh, if, if, it were, if, it were, if it were traded in Canadian dollars instead, you would see a much more moderate, you would see a much more moderate increase in the price of oil and gasoline today. And it makes me wonder how long the world market is going to put up with the volatility of the dollar as the unit of currency in which to trade oil. It won't surprise me very long, if, if before very long, traders are starting to say, we've got to move to a different currency. The dollar is simply not stable enough for us to plan our, our uh, contract, our futures contracts, and all of the other things we execute in dollars. I will not be surprised to see that happen, and it will be quite disruptive when it happens uh, in those markets. So the question is now, why is the dollar deteriorating? And this is what brings us to our friends at the United States Federal Reserve. Uh, the, the supply of money in the United States has far exceeded anything that would be normal growth in the supply of money. And as a consequence, uh, this is all the price we're paying now for the, for the bailouts, for the tarps, for all of the uh, rescue by the Federal Reserve of toxic securities out of the banking system in the, in the collapse of 2008. In effect, you are seeing the consequence of that now when you drive up and down the street and, and see $4 gasoline in front of you. Because the dollars, all of the liquidity that was injected into banks at the time is now actually turning into money. Technically speaking, at the time, uh, what the Federal Reserve provided was reserves for the banks. But those reserves are now finding their way to the street, so to speak. And in the end, keep in mind, the only thing you can do with a dollar, in the end, the only thing you can ever do with a dollar is buy something. You can buy a physical commodity. You can buy a fixed interest uh, income type of security, such as a bond. You can buy a, an equity type security such as a stock, but you can't buy anything else. And the reason I talk about stocks is it could well be that our run up in the stock market that we've witnessed in the last four months is artificial in the sense that these dollars have to find their way somewhere. And uh, some of them are finding their way into equity type investments. I'm, I'm afraid that in America we've made a pact with the monetary devil and it's time to pay that piper, and that's not going to be a cheap price. The, the price of gasoline is but one uh, reflection. It is but one outcome of, of the consequence 
of a monetary policy in this country which in my view has been extraordinarily excessive and uh, erratic. Where do we go from now for a few minutes and then now I will invite your attacks. You'll notice I am close to the door though. Um, <laughs> We could go in one of two directions here because a high price of gasoline, let us, let us say that some of it is real. Some of it is generated by that global demand that I alluded to earlier. Well, in some respects, that price of oil will serve as a very useful device for those of us here in the Western world in two respects. First of all, we will learn to more efficiently use it as we have been. Our conservation of gasoline and petroleum has been ongoing for a long time. The United States uh, consumption of petroleum, if we measure it as a proportion of gross domestic product, is down steadily over the past decades. Now, if, if the price were to stay high, say 120, 130 a barrel, I think we would witness in this country what we are best equipped at, and that is the technological innovation on the conservation side, and I think you would be quite fascinated to see what would come down the pike by profit-seeking entrepreneurs trying to find ways to sell us ways to better conserve our use of, and better conserve and economize on our use of petroleum. On the supply side, the price serves to bring producers and explorers and innovators in on that side. And I've been quite fascinated uh, to see what's happening in American petroleum and natural gas markets, as I'm sure many of you have. Over the past 18, 24 months, we're seeing some remarkably fascinating technologies. Hydraulic fracturing, or fracking as the, as the drillers call it, is uh, giving us ways to explore and extract reserves of uh, shale natural gas embedded in rock and deposits of oil uh, that, uh, that were un unreachable before. Hydraulic fracturing technologies as well as horizontal drilling. Uh, this country may have vastly more amounts of accessible petroleum as a, as a result of that technology uh, than we realized before, but those types of technologies are inspired by high profits, and the high profits are brought about by the prices. So, so the, the good news on high prices is that all of us will learn to adjust either as consumers or as investors. Uh, you know, if you, if you really are if you really are chagrined about gas prices, I've got a very simple solution for you, as I always tell my classes. Go buy the shares. Just go buy the shares. I mean, I've been an owner. If you want to see a big oil company, here I am. Uh, I've been a shareholder of uh, ExxonMobil for um, almost 20 years. Now, my paper gains over that time on ExxonMobil are far in excess of anything I've ever spent on oil and natural gas. Uh, and I want to thank you all very much. I mean, I just... Uh, <laughs> I appreciate your contributions, and, and uh, before you look at me with antagonism too much, I would, check, I would urge you to go check your uh, pension holdings, your, your 401k holdings, your mutual funds, because my guess is every adult, at least in this room, uh, you own an oil company. I just happen to own more uh, than some of you, and, uh, and, and so it's, it hasn't hurt me a bit. I personally think it's kind of nice, uh, and I see it from a very cheery uh, side, um, but the now, where can we not go from here? What can we do to harm ourselves even more? Nothing, nothing is more of a myth than the fact that we can be energy independent. If we want to be energy independent, it will come at a cost of a very substantial reduction in our living standards. Because those sources of energy independence have to be subsidized. Most of them are too cost ineffective for private enterprise to take on. Energy independence is a very costly uh, myth, and if we follow that to its conclusion, we might be ener energy independent, but we won't like what we see around us at the time. And I might add, too, as I often tell my classes, uh, this, this business of being dependent on foreign oil, uh, what many of us don't realize is that our single biggest source of imported oil, from all the sources that we obtain imports, our, our biggest source is Canada those evil, pernicious Canadians, uh, so seemingly bent on our destruction. I don't mind buying oil from Canada, I'm going to tell you, and I don't see any, any great harm in it. Uh, to be energy independent is going to send us down a path that uh, could easily drop our standard of living, and I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say 30%. The, the end is, uh, is it, it, the means will be so costly, you won't like the end. 
whenever you get there. What about alternative sources of energy since that's all tied up in the same thing? In my mind, again, the worst mistake we could make is to try to continue to subsidize alternative forms of energy. Notice I put the uh, emphasis on subsidize. As an economist, I got no problem against windmills, against solar panels, against ethanol, as long as they can be, that they can stand alone economically, as long as private investors decide there's enough of a market here to make money, uh, then those alternative sources will in fact become viable. They'll become online. But I don't know what price of oil per barrel it would take. It certainly isn't 110. I don't think it's 150. I've got a terrible suspicion it's not even 300 a barrel. The more you read about these sources and what they cost to develop and bring forth um, the electric automobile, another one, uh, the more I, I read about these things, the more I'm convinced that their costs are incomprehensibly high to try to develop those alternative means. For the foreseeable future, the energy source for America is surely in petroleum, natural gas, and coal. It is almost surely including some component that, that is imported. I'm not exactly sure how much, but my guess is some sort of what economists call equilibrium would be surely a third imported. I don't see any particular harm in that. But to go all out and to say energy independence, to me is, it makes me shudder for our younger generation because the youngsters are gonna be the one paying the taxes to support that great burden. The, the mistake many of us older generation makes when we say that um, you know, our youngsters are gonna pay all this burden the, the mistake they, we make is to think they're going to stick around. You don't have to stay here, do you, gentlemen? And uh, these guys right here have studied abroad enough to know that uh, there are other places in the world that might not give them as much tax burden as a country that insists on being energy independent on top of Medicare, Social Security, uh, and all the other burdens. Outside the box, look at the Federal Reserve. Inside the box, get mad at the oil companies. Uh, but I wanted to give you an outside uh, of the box view. Let me take on uh, any questions you have and uh, any, any, um, any contributions or observations any of you might want to add. For the foreseeable future, the energy source for America is surely in petroleum, natural gas, and coal. It is almost surely including some component that, that is imported. I'm not exactly sure how much, but my guess is some sort of what economists call equilibrium would be surely a third imported. I don't see any particular harm in that. But to go all out and to say energy independence to me is, it makes me shudder for our younger generation because the youngsters are gonna be the one paying the taxes to support that great burden. The, the mistake many of us older generation makes when we say that, um, you know, our youngsters are going to pay all this burden. The, the mistake they, we make is to think they're going to stick around. You don't have to stay here, do you, gentlemen? And uh, these guys right here have studied abroad enough to know that uh, there are other places in the world that might not give them as much tax burden as a country that insists on being energy independent on top of Medicare, Social Security, uh, and all the other burdens. Outside the box, look at the Federal Reserve. Inside the box, get mad at the oil companies. Uh, but I wanted to give you an outside uh, of the box view. Let me take on uh, any questions you have and uh, any, any, um, any contributions or observations any of you might want to add.